I just put here on the slide uh, some reasons why Americans have died in 2017. The automo automobile and gun-related deaths, that, those numbers haven't changed much. They've been relatively stable. So every year, 40,000 Americans die from automobile-related deaths. Now, has there been a movement to ban automobiles in the country? It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Hart, who is the Ziff Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at Columbia University. Thank you very much for taking your time to be with us. Dr. Hart's an international thought leader on the neuroscience of psychoactive drug use in people. Importantly, he has found in his scholarship and lived experience that social factors and biological factors must be integral to our policies related to abused drugs. He's author of more than 100 scientific articles and the textbook Drugs, Society, and Human Behavior. As he shares some of his work with us tonight, I expect our views towards drugs and drug users will be challenged and expanded. We are really spoiled to have the opportunity for a long Q&A with you afterwards. So I invite you all to uh, stick around, attend, and participate however you feel comfortable. Now would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Hart. I uh, dressed appropriately for the occasion. I see the, uh, the priest on the walls. Um, but uh, I may talk about some things uh, profane, a little different than what the priests usually talk about. Um, I, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, uh, I know you could be doing something else. I know recently Massachusetts legalized weed and you could be smoking and getting high or something, but you instead you decided to come check me out. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, today is um, have a conversation about uh, a recent book. I just finished, actually. I just turned over, I think, my last edits to um, the editor. I think the, they were the last edits. I certainly hope so. Uh, the new book is called Drug Use for Grown Ups. And so um, in my way, I will push the society um, as academics, I think, should do, particularly academics with tenure and academics with um, uh, who's concerned about their society. Um, now, for this new book, one of the things I did was I went on an intellectual journey. It was both geographical as well as intellectual. Uh, where um, I traveled all around the world, five continents. Uh, much of the stuff I'll talk about tonight, or some of the stuff I'll talk about tonight, deals with my own research that's done in the laboratory where we bring people in the lab and we give them drugs and we study the effects of drugs uh, in order to help with treatment and also to help understand what drugs do and they don't do, because there's so much misinformation about drugs. The drugs that I'm talking about, of course, are the sexy ones. Cocaine, heroin, marijuana, uh, methamphetamine, MDMA, psilocybin, all of those drugs uh, that uh, um, people take because they want to have a good time, usually. Um, and so this journey that I went on, um, I have to think about it in terms of one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin, when he said that you cannot know what you would discover on the journey, uh, what you will do or what you find, or what you find will do to you. It's a profound statement because that's exactly what happened with me on this journey. Uh, you will see that I, I didn't know what I was going to find, but it certainly it changed me. It changed me in a profound way, in a way that makes me want to leave this country, actually. And I'm gonna share some of those things with you all tonight. Um, some of the lessons that I learned and some of what I think we should do in this country. So if you all uh, would, please come back with me on this journey. And also, by the way, you know, you can be, 
you can laugh, you can be engaged, and you can talk, you can say things, and you can react, okay? It's all right. Um, um, I feel like I'm in church. Uh, all right, lesson one. Um, one of the first things that I learned on this journey, this journey that's been more than 30 years now, is that this is so obvious, but I didn't know this. I've been studying drugs, thinking that I was doing good by my community by telling people, for example, to stay away from drugs, drugs destroy my community, all of the same tropes that you all know. But I discovered from my research and from just traveling around the world, uh, engaging with people who do drugs, responsible people, uh, people who are college students, college professors, um, people who are captains of industry. But the, one of the things that I discovered was that the predominant effects of drugs are positive. But this is not what we're told in the popular press, in our movies, in documentary films, and so forth. You're not told that. You're predominantly told these negative effects, you know? Can you imagine if you were into automobiles, which you can die from driving an automobile? That's a fact. But can you imagine as you go and do a Google search about automobiles and all the things that comes up are things about automobile accidents? That would be, uh, that's what happens with drugs. But when you look at the data, the predominant effects are positive. These are just a few studies that we have done. Uh, this is a study comparing methamphetamine to MDMA. MDMA, of course, is this drug called, uh, that the kids call today, I think, Molly. Do you all call it, or have you changed the name? You know, when I was coming up, we used to call it ecstasy, uh, but now it's called Molly. Um, and MDMA and methamphetamine, they are chemical cousins. The only difference is on your right, you can see the red circle. Uh, that's a methylene dioxide ring. That's the only difference of the drugs. And what we found was that both of the drugs increase euphoria, produce all of these pleasant effects. Uh, there were some divergent effects. Um, uh, MDMA is a little better at producing empathy or some of those other things, but by and large, they produce p overwhelmingly positive effects. Uh, another study that we did, uh, this is one of the earlier studies uh, where I, when I was studying crack cocaine uh, in, in the 80s, I thought crack cocaine was, was, was destroying the black community, and so I was determined to do research that would uh, come up with a cure for crack cocaine addiction, but this is a simple study that we, we did in where uh, we gave people a choice between crack cocaine and $5 in cash to see whether or not um, um, the, the people who met cri uh, criteria for uh, crack cocaine use disorder, whether or not they would take the drug on every occasion, even when you have an alternative. But when you have an alternative as little as five dollars, little as five dollars, you see that they take drug on about the same amount of time as they take the money, which was surprising to me back in 1999 when I was running these studies because I thought that people who were addicted to crack would take crack on every occasion. And we followed this up with other studies by increasing the amount of money that we offered them um, compared to the hit. Uh, when you increase the amount of money to something like $20, they almost never take crack cocaine or methamphetamine. We do this across different drugs. And so one of the things that it told me was that I was ignorant. Uh, I was believing uh, anecdote and not uh, uh, attending to principles that govern human behavior, like when you have attractive alternatives uh, people will take those alternatives. But it told me that people, even when they are so-called drug addicted, can and do make rational choices. Uh, they overwhelmingly take the money when you increase the amount of money. There, we've done other studies with other alternatives as well. Now, I know some of you all, since we are at a university, some of you all are saying, well, Professor Hart, Maybe they just took the money in your lab, but when they left your lab, they went out and found their drug dealer, and they used your money to buy drugs, right? Yeah. 
Could be, you know, these studies were done in the hospital and then once they finished, they saved up their money and then they went and found their drug dealer. Maybe so, but if they did, again, it went against the normal narrative that was being told that drug, that people who met criteria for drug addiction had difficulties engaging in executive cognitive functioning such that they couldn't inhibit they couldn't have this long-term planning. They couldn't uh, delay gratification and so forth. Well, if they did wait until they found, they, until the study was over, they did what we asked, we placed a lot of demands on them, they did all those sorts of things, and then they engaged in planning, that's a good thing. It went against what we thought originally, even if they went out and bought drugs. But I know many didn't because in some cases we wrote checks to pay, to pay bills for some of them. Uh, instead, they wanted us to pay certain bills. But the point is, is that folks, even, in, even if they meet criteria for substance use disorder, can and do behave rationally, especially when you present attractive alternatives. And so these kinds of things, these are the kind of findings we and others were, were finding. And so it was, uh, it was blowing my mind and causing me some cognitive dissonance because it was going against what I believed. Uh, so seeing all of these sort of positive effects was inconsistent with my belief system. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that drug effects are only good. That's not the impression that I want to leave you all with because you know that the country at the moment is losing its mind in response to the so-called op opioid crisis. You all have been affected, right? right? Yes, you all in the house? <laughs> it's okay to say, yeah, you're in the house, all right. Um, all right, so when we think about something like overdoses, that's, this, is, has, this has been a large concern about the country. It's a concern that I have um, when we think about opioid-related overdoses. So I, I just put here on this slide uh, some reasons why Americans have died in 2017. Uh, the first, in the green, uh, there have been almost 50,000 Americans who died from an opioid-related death in 2017. When you just take out the heroin-related deaths, um, that's 15,000. And then other sort of activities like gun-related death, there have been about 40,000. Automobile-related death, there have been 40,000 or so. The automo automobile and gun-related deaths that those numbers haven't changed much. They've been relatively stable. So every year, 40,000 Americans die from automobile-related deaths. Now, has there been a movement to ban automobiles in the country? Not no, but hell no, right? And automobiles, of course, can be particularly, da can be dangerous. Right? So we make sure people have training before they get behind the wheel. We make sure they are appropriate age, uh, seat belts, speed limits. We do all of these things to make sure that we can decrease that number. But we're not going to ban automobiles. We're not even going to ban guns in this country. You all have been, you all have been privy to this conversation, right? The Second Amendment protects this, and this is not an argument to ban guns or anything, it's just a reality. And so, again, we try to have safety measures in place when we think about these other activities. Um, and even though guns, by the way, are designed to kill people, whereas drugs are designed to bring people relief, pleasure. You all, you all feel me? You see the difference? Okay, now back to the opioid-related deaths. Now, I didn't tell you that when we think about like the opioid-related deaths, the way these things work is that when we have the opioid-related deaths, if an opioid is in your body, um, it's considered, it's, it's counted. So you can have multiple opioids in your bodies 
one person, but they can have four or five opioids or any dr other drugs in their body, and those drugs are counted once each, right? Now, when we think about opioid-related deaths, it's, it's not well understood why people are dying from overdoses, but we have some clues. It's important to know that death from only heroin or any other opioid is rare. It's kind of difficult to die from heroin alone unless you are a non-tolerant kind of naive person and you take an extremely large dose. Not many people do that kind of thing. It's, it's very difficult. Most people, when they die from an opioid-related death, it's because they are combining opioids with other sedatives like benzodiazepines. You all know Xanax, right? This is a college campus, and I'm sure you all know that. Uh, and you all know maybe Prince Valium. Uh, back in the day, Prince Valium was big. Uh, nerve pain medications, things like uh, gabapentin or Neurontin, you guys may know that, Lyrica, those kind of medications, they, indu they induce sedation, uh, antihistamines, particularly the older ones, something like promethazine, uh, really good at decreasing itchiness and some other sort of things that come with uh, allergic reactions. But promethazine is one that really induces a lot of sedations, particularly these older ones. But also acetaminophen is a big reason that people die as well. Acetaminophen, by the way, when you get a drug like Percocet, you guys know Percocet? Percocet has a small amount of opioid in it, only about five milligrams of Oxycontin. That's a really low dose of Oxycontin and 325 milligrams of acetaminophen, large dose. Acetaminophen, you only need about 20 of those pills to knock out your liver, to cause liver toxicity. And 20 pills of, oxy, of, of uh, Percocet at like five milligrams, that's not enough to really get high, to get the kind of high of a, that a tolerant person will need. So a number of people don't even know that these medications contain that much acetaminophen. So a lot of people are subjecting themselves to potential harm as a result. And these, this sort of nuance is never in the, in the stories that talk about the so-called opioid crisis. So people are not dying from opioids per se, they're dying from ignorance. Um, another reason that they're dying is that many of the street drugs, opioids like heroin, are now contaminated with drugs like fentanyl and other fentanyl analogs. Fentanyl is a more potent heroin, meaning that there, there are small amounts of it that's required to produce an effect, including overdose. So fentanyl can be 50 to 100 times more potent than something like heroin. But then when you talk about other types of fentanyl, like carfentanil, that's even more potent. And so you can imagine if some unsuspecting person thinks that they have heroin, and they have heroin tainted with fentanyl or just fentanyl, and they take their normal dose, that's a hot dose that can kill you. So these sorts of things have contributed to many of these deaths that we're seeing, um, but this is not difficult to deal with because fentanyl, by the way, is an FDA-approved medication. We've been using that drug here in the United States since about 1960. It's really good at, at, at treating intense breakthrough pain, and so um, it's going to be around, it's going to stay around, and it's been used safely. But when you don't know that you have fentanyl, that's a problem. Again, people are not dying because of opioids per se, they're dying because of ignorance. But this is solvable, so solvable. We can solve these kind of problems by simply doing what they do in South America, in Europe, all around the world, except uh, in the United States. We do it, but we, it's done underground, this thing that we call uh, drug consumption rooms, where 
people can go to these locations in usually in larger cities like New York where uh, there, there's a room or there's a, a, a space where uh, drug consumption can occur in a monitored sort of private area. If people are homeless, uh, they don't have to be injecting or using drugs in some unlit place or not well lit place that makes it even more dangerous. Uh, and it's all, also in these spaces, they can get drug-related education. Um, they get uh, other sort of medical and psychosocial help that they may need uh, because these places are typically staffed by nurse, nurses and other sort of medical experts. Uh, they do these things in Switzerland, at Amsterdam, uh, Barcelona, all around the world, and they don't have these kind of crises that we have in this country. Also, in these spaces and other spaces, they have these things that we call drug purity testing services. Um, typically, this is an anonymous where somebody can submit a small sample of their drug for a chemical analysis of their substance. And so if the substance contained an adulterant, a contaminant that's dangerous, they have that information. If it, if, even, if, even if it contains something like fentanyl, they know now to scale back their use. Again, these services exist for free in many countries all around the world and they don't have an overdose crisis like we have in the United States. This is really simple. This is so elementary and fundamental, unless, of course, you are moralistic and you think that people shouldn't alter their consciousness. Well, they can alter their consciousness as long as they're using alcohol or caffeine, but not with these other things. And so um, when we think about, when people talk about drug addiction or drug use as a public health sort of thing, um, it's not really in the United States. We are quite moralistic, and our moralism is killing us. And so um, that's just, again, these are things that I've learned on my journey around the globe. Um, now, another thing that I don't want to underplay is this issue related to addiction. Now, I know people are, that we are always concerned that people may become addicted to a substance and, and you know, that's a, real, that's a real concern and that's an important concern. But the thing that we, we all should know is that relatively few people who use even the most vilified drugs like heroin and crack cocaine relatively few numbers of those people or the overwhelming majority of those users don't become addicted. You know, most of these people are upstanding citizens. Um, uh, what, maybe 10 to 25% will become addicted. And that's still, that's, a, that's an issue that we have to deal with. So I don't want to downplay that, but I just want to make the point that the vast majority of those people who use drugs never become addicted. They are responsible pillars of their communities. They, are, they pay their taxes, they take care of their children, uh, they give lectures, what university? <laughs> <laughs> they teach at universities, um, they become president of the United States. Um, all three of these guys all used illicit drugs when they were young men. Uh, we know Bill Clinton s smoked marijuana, said he didn't inhale. We all laugh at that now because we know that's a joke. Um, uh, George Bush, too, smoked marijuana. He's widely suspected of using cocaine. He never admitted, but we know. Um, that, and that's not to besmirch his reputation that God served his country and he did his best. Uh, um, uh, Barack Obama, of course, admits to using marijuana as well as uh, cocaine. 
um, Barack Obama even like made a joke about it when they asked him if he he inhaled and he looked and he said that was the point you know uh, <laughs> but you can see that all three of these men you know if they were my children I'd be proud of them you know I might be arguing with them about their policies but I would be proud that they at least they served their country to the best of their ability and they were they didn't embarrass well well, they didn't embarrass us as much as this guy, right? But uh, so this is the only guy who said that he doesn't use any drugs. <laughs> now, if he didn't, use, if he doesn't use any drugs, the major point is clear. Then maybe he should, right? <laughs> That's not the major point. No, it's not the major point. You, you know, uh, Donald Trump has taken up too much intellectual energy in our country as it is. So I won't say much more about him. Um, it's just too easy. The, uh, Stephen Colbert and the rest of the comedians, they'll be doing that tonight. But uh, my major point here is this. It's really simple. If the majority of the people who use any drug, any particular drug, do not become addicted, then we can't blame the drug for drug addiction. And we have been too comfortable in this country doing that. We have been too comfortable saying, we're gonna go after the drug. That's ridiculous. And, but but I, if, if the drug itself is not the problem, I need to talk about what are the problems, why people become addicted. I would just wanna say a word about the people who do become addicted. People who become addicted, there are predictable factors. Uh, and we've known this for a long time. But in order to get to the bottom of the person's problem, we have to make sure we give a comprehensive examination or assessment of that person. And that takes some experience, it takes an experienced person, and it takes some, an experienced person some time to really do a careful evaluation to figure out what's driving the pathological use of the substance. Uh, now, we know some things that are critically important when it comes to addiction. We know that people who have mental illnesses or other types of illnesses are much more likely to become addicted to a substance than those folks who don't have these ailments. So it tells you something about some of the risk factors. Another risk factor, uh, well, the bottom line is that if you treat these sort of illnesses, it goes a long way in preventing addiction. When you treat these, these illnesses well, it, may, it might even mean, for example, that you increase people's dose of pain medication. It might actually mean that, but you have to uh, make sure that you treat folks uh, uh, and, and so they are not doing other things that are uh, unacceptable in terms of trying to get the treatment. Um, uh, another reason that people have become addicted relates to this issue of poverty. Homelessness, we know that when you make sure that people are, uh, they have homes and those sorts of things, uh, their drug use, whether it's alcohol or some other drug use, the consequences of that use are not as bad. Um, studies have shown this sort of thing. We also know economic, power, economic poverty, it plays an important role in determining whether or not who will become addicted, who will have problems. When we think about the country today with opioids, we oftentimes we highlight nowhere Ohio, no disrespect to Ohio, but there's, some places in Ohio where we have large rates of opioid-related problems. And then we also go to West Virginia. What happened in those places? The factories, they all left. Uh, people have no viable sort of jobs, or not, at least not jobs that will take care of their families. Educational skills are really important, too, in terms of understanding your bodies, understanding what's happening um, when you're starting to get in a, having a problem. Learning skills, how to inhibit 
in certain domains of, uh, of, of, of your, your life. Uh, all of these things are important. Um, when we subject people to unrealistic expectation, I'm thinking about people who are celebrities uh, who become addicted. You can imagine the young celebrity who has taken care of their family all of their life with their stardom, and they have all of these unexpected uh, or, or these unrealistic expectations heaped on them at an early age, and then if they don't need no longer have the, the kind of income that they had, you can imagine what kind of problems those are. You know, or you can think about people who cannot allow the public to know that they like to alter their consciousness from time to time and how they have to hide this behavior and then they put themselves at greater risk because um, we, I'm thinking of somebody like Prince, for example, who died of an opioid-related death. Uh, he thought he had Oxycontin when he had fentanyl uh, because uh, certain channels may have closed and now you have another channel that you have to go and uh, the fentanyl uh, um, was, uh, of course, so potent he didn't realize that's enough to kill you. All of these sorts of things play an important role in why people get in trouble and how people get in trouble. Um, um, uh, and another sort of thing that I learned is related to this issue of uh, drug addiction as a brain disease. This is the dominant theory in, in, drug, in drug abuse science. The theory holds that um, there are neural or neurobiological substrates or markers that differentiate those people who are addicted to drugs versus those people who are not addicted to drugs. That's a simple sort of way of thinking about this. So when we're thinking about drug addiction, I just talked about some predictive factors. If we deal with those, uh, predictive, those uh, predictable factors, we, it will go a long way in helping people with problems. But my science is, right now, hell-bent on this notion of drug addiction is a brain disease. So um, I just want to share this. Uh, uh, this is a paper published by Nora Vokal. She is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, these folks fund 90% of the world's research in this area. Just want to focus on this paper just for one second because it's published in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, perhaps the most uh, widely read medical journal in the world. Um, this is just a quote that I take I took out from this article. Uh, now, if, in order to get a New England Journal publication, uh, it has to be a really good paper. I mean, because this it's a really tough journal to get published in, and this is just a, a quote from. Uh, this particular article, it says early volunteer drug use, if early volunteer drug use goes undetected and unchecked, the resulting changes in the brain can ultimately erode a person's ability to control the impulse to take addictive drugs. Now, one of the things that I love about science is that we have these clear sort of dependent measures that we, we've defined, we operationally define or whatever, and we see it. And then you measure it and it's clear. Now, I don't know how we measure the eroding of a, a, person, uh, a person's ability to control the impulse to take addictive drugs. I don't know exactly how we, she measured this kind of thing. Uh, there's no, there no, by the way, there are no data that has ever measured this in, in humans, certainly. And I don't, uh, or certainly shown this kind of thing, but these are the kind of statements that's in this piece. The point is, is that it's a horrible paper that's published in the premier journal, and there are many of these horrible kind of papers that are not supported by evidence that promulgate this notion that drug addiction is a brain disease. Now, when we know that we have these other predictable factors that we can really go after and deal with to really help people, I talked about some of them earlier, 
But our science, it's focused here in this sort of area where there's so limited data or evidence for it. But let me just, let me just tell you what I mean. This notion, what, I'll tell you why I'm so disturbed. I'm disturbed because I started out studying Parkinson's disease. And so I know something about Parkinson's disease. I think Parkinson's disease is a brain disease, of course, and Huntington's disease, too, is a brain disease. I say this because both of these illnesses are progressive, they are irreversible, and they are fatal. The persons, unfortunately, will die from symptoms related to these illnesses. And then when you look in the brains, particularly the midbrains, the striatum, of these individuals, you can see this sort of progression, the steady progression uh, through the clinical manifestation of the disorder. You see this sort of decline. You see this atrophy that's happening under these conditions. So you have this biological sort of substrate. You see also the clinical symptoms with these brain diseases. Compare that with something like drug addiction. With drug addiction, the vast majority of the people who are afflicted with drug addiction, when I say drug addiction, I simply mean the DSM criteria, substance use disorder. The vast majority of people who are afflicted with this condition recover without treatment. Not progressive, not fatal, not irreversible. And then there are no, neuro, no neurobiological correlates where we can look at the brains of someone who is addicted and compare it with someone who's not and be able to tell the difference. No neurobiological correlates. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm disturbed that our field, my field, gets so much attention or has given so much attention to this particular explanation when we have these other sort of more evidence-based areas to pursue that could actually help people. So that's why I'm concerned. Now, I have to tell you, I understand, I understand the impulse to do this. I know why we do this because, in fact, uh, I went to graduate school in the, in the early 1990s uh, from 1990 to 2000, George Bush won, President won, proclaimed it the decade of the brain. We pumped a lot of money into uh, schools, universities, in order to get people to study neuroscience. I had a fellowship that paid for my entire PhD based on this notion, and, and so I was determined to find the neurobiological mechanisms that was responsible for crack cocaine addiction. I learned a whole heck of a lot about the dopamine transporter, about catecholamine metabolism. I love that stuff. And one of the things that I learned was that amphetamines are really good at large doses at producing neurotoxicity. So when you give a large dose of amphetamine, the amphetamine, methamphetamine, to an animal who is naive, you can destroy or damage neurons, particularly the monoamine neurons, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. You can destroy those neurons or damage them. Uh, and you can also see some problems with the animal's behavior. And so that, that was one of the reasons that led people to start to think that these drugs are causing people to be, have this sort of toxicity. So I get it. But the problem is the doses are given at levels that are 10, 20, 40 times what a human will take. A human will die before, before, we, uh, before they take another dose if you give them those large doses. Another problem is that when you allow the animal to slowly develop tolerance over time by giving uh, low doses initially and then slowly escalating the dose and then you give a large bolus dose, you can block the neurotoxic effects. You can block these sort of effects. The point is, 
the doses that we use in many of these studies that have shown the neurotoxicity in laboratory animals are not relevant to the human condition. And oftentimes, humans develop tolerance. They don't start out, you don't go to a party and be like, yo, give me the largest dose you got. You don't do that. You won't be around if you do. You won't be around to, to enjoy it. And so um, that's where this kind of notion comes from. I get it. So one of the things it motivated me to do was to publish a review of all of the human data that was looking at all of the sort of neuroimaging human data that was looking at methamphetamine users or methamphetamine folks who met criteria for addiction. I wanted to look at all of the human data to find out to see whether or not there were brain differences in these folks compared to people who had not used methamphetamine before. And I also wanted to know whether or not the cognitive performance of the methamphetamine users would be different from folks who did not use methamphetamine. I mean, this is, I chose to look at the methamphetamine literature because the amphetamines are better at producing toxicity than any of the other drugs that people like to take for fun. So what I found was that when you control for age and education, that is, make sure people score, if they're methamphetamine users, make sure their scores are compared with that of a normative database correcting for age and education. So not comparing high school students or high school graduates to college graduates. That's not right. And that's what happens in the literature. So you have people who use methamphetamine, high school graduate or not. Compare it with people who graduated from college on, a, on some cognitive test. Methamphetamine users may get outperformed in those conditions, but when you compare them to people who are like them, age and education uh, level, then you see that they score within the normal range of functioning. They are normal. What about brain imaging? Well, uh, so I, I have to tell you that when I, when I say brain imaging, I looked at uh, fMRI, PET scans, and that sort of thing. The fMRI data, were, there were no consistency. Uh, researchers couldn't even replicate findings of their, their own findings. The only sort of consistency that you found was with PET imaging. I just want to tell you what PET imaging is just quickly. Just PET imaging is where we inject a radioactive chemical or compound into your bloodstream. And this compound uh, oftentimes in these studies uh, bind to dopamine receptors or bind to monoamine, other monoamine transporters or something. And they bind to these areas or cells that we think would be destroyed by by dopamine, I mean by uh, methamphetamine. And so he, here's just quick data. I just want to just quickly show you these data. I don't want to overwhelm you. By the way, when people show you pretty pictures, and these are imaging data, these are data. Oftentimes what people show you in the, in, under these sort of circumstances when you give a talk is you just show a pretty picture and you say, yeah, this one lights up more than that one. That's not data. These are data. Okay, so these are the data. Um, um, and the, the controls are the circles, and the triangles are the people who use methamphetamine. This is a representative study. It's very simple, and this is in the midbrain. This is a dopamine-rich area, uh, the striatum, a, a dopamine-rich area. These are just areas throughout. And this here horizontal line is the mean score for each of the group, mean score for each of the group. And uh, each of these symbols represent one person, each person. What we see is that the methamphetamine users in the triangles have less binding potential than the controls. That means that when you injected your radioactive compound into their brains or their bodies and goes to their brains, that less of that chemical binded in that region. 
It's an indirect measure of saying, uh, uh, telling you something about the availability of those receptors or those cells. Indirect measure. So we can say, well, if the cells are not there, then maybe they're di they've died or maybe they're damaged. So that's an indirect measure. It's not a direct measure because we have to do some other thing, but it's an indirect measure. And so what we see across the studies, these kind of studies, is that the methamphetamine users have a 10 to 15 percent lower binding potential than the controls. 10 to 15 percent different. Are we there? This is an important point. I'm trying to make it as simple and clear. I hope it's, we're in the house. Okay, based on these data, these are the best data, by the way. Based on these data, it has helped to promulgate the notion that methamphetamine users and other people who, are, who meet criteria for a substance use disorder are, have this brain disease or brain damage of some sort. Now, let's look at the data. If we look at the data, we can see there are a few outliers in the controls um, that are pulling the mean score um, uh, away from each other. And another thing that what we can see is that the overwhelming majority of all of the participants look about the same. So if you shuffled up each person's image and asked somebody to pull out the methamphetamine users versus the controls, you couldn't do it. What I'm trying to tell you is that this 10 to 20% difference is most likely within the normal range of human variability. Some people are tall, some people are short, some people, that's variability. That's the normal range of variability. I think it's the normal range, or I make that claim because when we look at function, and that's why we look at the brain, because we want to know about people's functioning. When we look at these folks functioning, they are performing normally. They are normal. They are functioning normal. So you would be hard pressed, based on data that look like this, to say that somehow these folks are brain damaged or they have some brain issues. You all feel me? Did you all follow that logic? And this is what's going on in my field. And so one of the things I've done is started to write popular pieces to highlight this for the general audience. This was a piece that a colleague and I wrote in the American Scientist. It's a sort of popular sort of science magazine to try to explain this to the general public so they could understand how they're being hoodwinked. And I'm also writing in places like Nature. Nature is another, is one of those top journals that scientists read. And I'm writing op-eds and uh, commentaries to also to challenge my colleagues to show me better data than this or to show me how those data indicate that people are brain damaged. And so I'm, 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 I, because I'm disturbed about what this means for people who are being uh, labeled as being brain da damaged. Uh, because it's, uh, the brain damage is a serious charge. And it's not warranted based on those data. Now, another thing that I learned along the way, and this is part of the sort of uh, labeling people as being brain damaged. Another thing I learned along the way is that these drugs, the fun drugs that people are taking, are being scapegoated so that authorities can avoid dealing with problems that, the real problems that poor people face. It's so much easier to say that we're going to rid the community of crack cocaine than to say we're going to make sure everybody has a job that pays a decent wage, going to make sure people are educated, going to make sure people have health care, we're going to do, 
Those are far more complicated. It's so much easier to say, we're going to put more cops on the street, and we're going to get rid of crack cocaine, we're going to get rid of heroin, we're going to, so much easier to do that than to deal with real problems that people face. So we scapegoat, we scapegoat drugs in this way. And we also scapegoat drugs so that we can target and control people we don't like without explicitly saying we don't like them. So it's so much easier to say, <laughs> it's so much easier to say that those damn Mexicans are bringing drugs across the border than to say that we don't like Mexicans. So we're going to go after the drugs that they're bringing across the border. We did that with black people in the 80s with crack. This is what we do. And we fall for it. And not only that, um, a number of us, we got paid because of that. I mean, I wouldn't have a career if we weren't scapegoating drugs. The scientists are participating in this. We get big grants because of this whole thing. We're all benefiting. As Upton Sinclair once said, that it's difficult to can, um, um, uh, it's difficult, I feel like George Bush too. It's difficult, it's difficult to convince a, a, a man or a woman of, uh, of a problem when his or her salary is being, is dependent upon him or her not understanding. So if your salary is dependent upon you not understanding it, you won't understand it. So, that takes me to an issue I have to define because I'm going to talk now for a few minutes uh, before I close about racial discrimination or racism. I'm going to use these, these, these terms interchangeably because it has something to do with the scapegoating of drugs. Uh, when I use the term racial discrimination or racism, I'm simply referring to an action that results in disproportionate, unfair, or un just treatment of persons from a specific racial group. So there is a behavioral act and outcome. I don't care what's in your head, because if you didn't mean to do it, that, that's fine, but the act still occurred and the person is still harmed, right? Now one of the things that my field has become really skilled at is deflecting attention away from what really matters. Like psychology, we talk about implicit bias, which may or may not have anything to do with racial discrimination. Implicit bias is this thing that's in people's head. It's actually like a computer game, how fast you respond to words and so forth. It's not, it's not what, what, what happened at Starbucks, for example, when the brothers in Philly, they were kicked out of Starbucks. You all may remember Starbucks clothes for the day, did explicit, they did implicit bias training, which had nothing to do, may, may had nothing to do with that act of racial discrimination. But it's a way to fool people in that, to do, that you're doing something when you're not. And implicit bias, stereotype threat, all of these psychological terms are really with us to avoid dealing with racial discrimination, racism. It's really clear. You have this disproportionate, unfair treatment un uh, that, uh, uh, that happens among a specific racial group. Very simple. Deal with what's before you. Not what's in people's head, not what's in people's heart. When people start doing that sort of thing, then you know it's a trick to not to deal with the issue. Very simple. In science, we have the clearly defined our dependent measures for that reason. OK, now I have to take you back to the 80s, because this is how I got involved with this sort of stuff. In the 1980s, uh, we were told that uh, crack cocaine was destroying the community, destroying the community that I cared about. In Boston, if you all know your Boston history, you were critical in this uh, regard. Because in 1986, the 1986 NBA draft, you all know who was the second overall pick in the 1986 draft? Oh, who said Lynn Bias? Right on, Lynn Bias. 
Lynn Baez was the second pick uh, in the draft, and Lynn Baez went out and celebrated because he was excited, and he died, and he had taken some cocaine. The media reports said that he had um, done crack cocaine for the first time, and it killed him. And it was evidence of how dangerous the drug was. A week later, Don Rogers of the Cleveland Brown, he was their defensive uh, player of the year the year before, and he died of a cocaine-related death. And the media said that it was because of crack. In both cases, it wasn't the case. They were, they were, they were mistaken uh, in terms of the crack. Um, never mind, it doesn't matter. We passed those laws, uh, the 1980. Six law in 1988, Anti-Drug Abuse Acts, uh, they punished crack cocaine violations 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine violations. And what they did in 86, it brought back the death penalty for uh, cocaine traffickers, and it brought back uh, ma mandatory minimum penalties meaning that people went to jail for small amounts of crack in order to uh, trigger the same penalty for uh, powder cocaine, you had to have 100 times more powder cocaine. And the 1988 law was extended to just simple possession. And also the 1988 law said that the country would become drug free by 1995. And this was written into law. How'd that work out? <laughs> that was written in the law. Smart people wrote this in the law. Okay, well, one of the things that happened was that what we saw, the U.S. Sentencing Commission did a study, and what they found was that 90% of the people who were convicted under these laws were black people. Even though black people did not comprise the majority of crack cocaine users, and people were appalled. They, this is the early 90s, 94, so they were, they were concerned. And then they were equally concerned when they found out that crack and powder cocaine were essentially the same drug. The only difference, if you focus your attention on the left, is the red circle, is that the powder cocaine contained a hydrochloride group. It adds nothing to the pharmacology of the drug. It's there to keep the compound stable, meaning that you can't smoke it. That's about it. If you want to smoke it, you have to remove the hydrochloride portion. And you can do that by boiling it with water, with baking soda, heating it up, and then letting it dry out. The hydrochloride portion will leave, and now you're just left with the base, and you can smoke it. But the bottom line is, when you dissolve powder cocaine in water and inject it intravenously, it produces the same intensity onset of effects as smoking the drug. They are the same drug. So the Sentencing Commission found all of this out. They had all of these hearings. They found it out. The Sentencing Commission, by the way, are the people who determine the penalty for each sort of in law infractions. And the Sentencing Commission in the 94, the beginning of 95, submitted to Congress they amended the law to say that the drug should be treated equally. This is wrong. When they saw the racial discrimination, they said it should be treated equally. And it was the first time in the history of the Sentencing Commission that the president, Bill Clinton, and Congress rejected the recommendation, and they kept it the same. They rejected it. So now when we think about like race, races, who's racist, who's not, so now many of us make mistakes, and so we engage unwittingly in racial discrimination, but when the information is brought to our attention, we change our behavior, can't call us racist. The U.S. Sentencing Commission, that's what they did. Bill Clinton and Congress did not. Presented with the information, seeing the racial discrimination, and this, they didn't change their behavior. So in, no, in that domain, Bill Clinton and the Sentencing Commission were racist. That's what we call a racist in that specific domain, because we have the evidence in that domain. 
George Bush II came along, the Sentencing Commission resubmitted this, said, okay, how about one to five? We treat him one to five. Nope, how about one to 10? Nope, George Bush did exactly the same thing. Congress agreed with him. 2007, along comes Barack Obama on this issue, running for president, speaking at Howard University, he said, judges think that this is wrong, Republicans think that this is wrong, Democrats think this is wrong, and yet it's been approved by Republican and Democratic presidents because no one has been willing to brave the politics and make it right. That will end when I'm president. Did it end when Barack Obama became president? Well, kind of, in the Obama way, right? Kind of. <laughs> so, uh, Obama um, signed legislation that decreased the disparity from 100 to 1 to, to, to uh, uh, 18 to 1. So, it wasn't 1 to 1 as the science suggested and the scientists recommended uh, but the disparity was decreased. Still, this is inappropriate. I think Malcolm X spoke to this best posthumously when he said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six, there's no progress. So, now, this is back in the 80s and coming all the way up to present day time where the law remains, what Barack Obama signed it into law. But let's think about of uh, drugs being scapegoated and who's paying the price for when we think about opioids. That's today. And let's think about a governor who was just north of you guys not long ago, Paul LePage. Paul LePage, you all probably know Paul LePage better than most of the country, and he speaks for himself. And I'm going to let him talk talking about out-of-state drug dealers coming to Maine in response to a question. It's a topic he discusses at a lot of town hall forums. Here's what he said last night. The traffickers, these are people that take drugs. These are guys that are named D-Money, Smoothie, Shifty, uh, <laughs> these type of guys. They come from Connecticut, New York. They come up here, they sell their heroin, then they go back home. Incidentally, half the time they impregnate a young white girl before they leave which is a real sad thing because then we have another issue that we've got to deal with down the road. So the, LePage basically um, nicely in a matter of 30 seconds described how we've been carrying out drug policy in our country since uh, our inception, really when we started uh, this sort of drug war thing in the early 1900s. Um, but he was, it was, it was masterful. So he put aside the users in Maine. Maine, you all might know, is one of the whitest states in the union. They're like, so you have the white users you put aside. Say, it's not, it's not the users. It's the traffickers. It's D-Money, Shifty, and Smoothie. Who has those names? God damn. <laughs> um, and they're from Connecticut and New York. Again, if you don't get it, you know, with the names, we got to tell you where they're from. And so we know who we're going after. But this is how we've been carrying out our drug policy in this country since we started doing this sort of thing in the early 1900s. Now, uh, now there, that's not just what heroin, we think about marijuana even. These are just a few people who died in recent years because a cop or a cop proxy said that they smelled marijuana, they thought the person was on marijuana, and these people died. Marijuana, which is legal in Massachusetts. These are just a few of the recent people. But this is how we've been carrying out our drug policy. And now, today, we are excited about psychedelics, things like psilocybin, ketamine. I just have a slide here of PCP and ketamine. By the way, uh, ketamine is a derivative of PCP. We, we made uh, ketamine from PCP. They are disassociative uh, sort of psychedelics. They have uh, many of the same effects. PCP's effects last longer, but they have many of the same effects. They're, they, they are psychedelics. Um, and, and I just have this, just a quick slide here, uh, published in the late 80s uh, where 
Uh, John Morgan and his colleagues showed that this notion that connects PCP with violence is not justified. We know this, but yet and still, Rodney King, a number of people who were beaten by the police, the police said that they thought they had PCP. More recently in Chicago, some of you all might know the Laquan McDonald story. Laquan McDonald, I have to just show this quick video. Laquan McDonald uh, is this black kid who was shot by the police in Chicago. It's a bit graphic. He was shot 16 times by the police as he's walking away. Uh, but then later, uh, he shot down. Later, they said that he had PCP in his in his, in in his system, and they and the, the newspaper article said that he was out of control. But then they released the video a year later. We find this out. But PCP was used as the excuse, and. Only after the, 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 the release of the video because of the Freedom of the Information Act did we really find out the truth. The bottom line here is that no drug makes people super, have superhuman strength, but PCP, that story just won't go away. And a number of these drugs are used in this way to promulgate social injustice. Now I'm at the end of my talk, and I want to just say that uh, my journey has changed me after I have learned all of this stuff over 30 some years now. I'm changed. I was one of these people who thought that drugs was destroying the black community and I had to do something about it and I was going to solve the problem. And I was so wrong and I was, I mistreated people. I called people crackheads. I did all of those awful things because I believed all of this sort of thing. But now, um, education finally worked for me. And my education and my journey has profoundly changed me such that I believe that recreational drugs should be legally available to adults and regulated. It would be consistent with our Declaration of Independence. I invite you all to read it. It is such a beautiful document. It, in it, in the first sentence, it talks about these unalienable rights that we have. They can't be taken away. Three of them is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as you see fit even if that means you use drugs in the pursuit of your happiness. So long as you do not impact others to do the same, to pursue their rights. And then the next sentence is even more beautiful. It says that government should be created for the sole purpose of protecting those rights. It's amazing, that document. And it's amazing how we don't live according to the spirit of the founders. Never mind they plagiarized that document, but that's okay. It's a beautiful document. It's a beautiful document. I mean, this is just one of the things that Thomas Jefferson has said that I really like. He said, if, government, if people let government decide which foods they eat and medicines they take, their bodies will soon be in as sorry a state as the souls of those who live under tyranny. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, loved his opioids. Uh, but he's right. This means that there's a tremendous amount of responsibility for citizens, for free citizens. The price of freedom is responsibility. And you have to, that's the price that you have to pay. Now, We've already started to do this, as you all know, with uh, schemes that uh, deal with uh, the making cannabis available. You all have it here in this state. Uh, it ensures quality control. You don't get contaminants that we worry about, generate jobs, tax revenues. Uh, it's consistent with this notion of freedom and liberty. Several states in the United States and more are doing this, Canada, the entire country has done this. Uruguay, their country's done this. 
Of course, we need to have better education based on psychopharmacology. That's what I've been trying to provide for the public. That's what the new book is trying to do. I will continue to do this. How do we get here? Require people to have evidence when they're talking about drug-related issues. They can no longer just engage in conversations armed with information told to them by Uncle Jack. You all will be at Thanksgiving dinner soon. You will have an opportunity to try this out. Um, and also respectable people who use drugs. And there are a lot of us have to get out of the closet and so we can change this narrative about what respectable drug users look like and how they behave. They have, to get out of the they have to get out of the closet. I see it as a form of civil disobedience. When I think about my heroes, people like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, all of those folks, they broke the law in order to highlight the injustices, in order to highlight the fact that we were not living up to the promises of the Declaration of our founding documents. And that's what, that's what responsible people do. Because people are suffering. Otherwise, there are so many people who have lost their lives because of our moralism, because of our refusal to allow people to pursue happiness as they see fit. Now, I understand we have built this large law enforcement apparatus in our misguided war on drugs, uh, and I don't want people to lose their jobs, so this means that we will have to retrain and redirect the efforts of these people. I have some ideas about how to do that, but time is running short. I wrote about it in a new book, but I don't want to fire people. I don't want people to lose their jobs. And we just need to retrain them so that they can be partners in helping people to pursue happiness. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor to short speeches that are disguised as questions. And thank you for your time. Hi. Um yeah, so I just wanted to ask, I know kind of early on in the speech you mentioned, uh, I forget what you had called them, but I was, had always heard them referred to as like safe injection sites and how there's efforts in New York and obviously there's other countries which have been successful in implementing them. And I wanted to know if you think, um, you know, within the near future we would have any chance of that becoming a widespread um, thing in the United States and if so, how long you think it would be and what the ch obstacles would be in getting there. I don't know if we will have open in the United States. Uh, we do have them in the United States, um, but they're underground and local governments turn a blind eye to it and they sometimes help but they can't say it publicly, which is ridiculous. Like in New York we have them, um, Seattle, San Francisco, a number of places have them, uh, but they're just not open in the public's eye. Um, I don't think we will have them um, until the public demand that we do. And the public um, is just uninformed about the importance of them. And that's why we have to make sure we connect it to what's happening with opioid-related deaths uh, as a way to stem the tide and as a way to um, uh, help people to live another day. And so we need, we need the general sort of population to help the public understand uh, the value of this. And so uh, that's why we need people to be talking about this at Thanksgiving. And we need to, um, uh, because the lawmakers will follow the public, not the other way around. My Thank question you. is that you talked about how um, black and brown people have probably paid the cost for our drug policies in these murals, but now that it's starting to become more legal, white people are actually gaining the most from it because they're making a lot more money. And so we're almost seeing like, so black people played the brunt of this war on drugs, but now it's becoming legal, white people are making all this money off of it. And so do you have any thoughts about that, especially as we, as we talk about racial discrimination in regards to drug usage? 
is it, are, are we seeing something now where, yeah, that basically like, like the majority of people who made these laws to hurt and harm people of color are now benefiting from the legalization of, of these laws? Oh, you just described America. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what we do in our country, um, capitalism. Um, one of the things that's happening, even in this state especially, I mean, you guys have a really good sort of uh, marijuana legalization sort of board. Um, they're trying to make sure that you have uh, representation in terms of minority or ownerships and licenses, where, whereas other states were not as attentive to that. California tried to be attentive to that, and it looks like only in Oakland it's really playing out that way. And so as more states come online in terms of marijuana legalization, um, uh, people have to be advocating for um, uh, these sorts of set-asides for people who paid the price. So like it's so warped in most places uh, people who went to jail for a marijuana-related offense can't be in the industry. Uh, California, that's different, and I believe here is different. You guys have tried to make things uh, different, but uh, the issue just has to keep being raised in these states that are legalizing. Like, we have the 2020 election coming up, and there's going to be a number of states that put it on their ballot. Um, like I think Jersey and those kind of places in New York and there are all of these uh, these issues are being put on the ballot and um, uh, we'll see how it plays out but if history is any indication uh, it's gonna play out just like Nike or any other sort of uh, commodity um, unfortunately you did a, uh, an amazing job for me in demonstrating how the government is not designed to serve everyone. It's designed to serve certain people. And so how then can we as the bottom up, how can we sort of address this problem without relying on the government at all or the, any of the dominant structures? Uh, the current administration, the current president has made me really think about this because on a daily basis, I get frustrated about some of the things that I see, and it becomes overwhelming. And then it's like I don't, it's too easy to yell at people or do that kind of thing. So one of the things that it's done for me is that I had to look at myself and understand the role that I played in allowing this to go on. And I'm a college professor. And I never teach about the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. I never do that. And that's a failure on my part. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do with my teaching now is I try to get my students to understand what a beautiful document this is in terms of liberty. and and protecting our responsibility to protect other people's liberty. If we, if we, if we um, encourage, urge, implore people, our students, um, highlight for them that it's their responsibility, my responsibility to protect other people's liberty, I think that will go a long way. Um, and I think but we have to also not be moralistic about this. There's a reason we have separation of church and state. It's so long as people are not impacting other people's rights and freedoms, fine, enjoy yourself. And that's one of the things I've been trying to do, like with the new book, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that we understand that one, and in that way, it will guard against all of this nonsense that we're seeing going on. We want to make sure that we protect people's liberties, everybody's liberties. And so I'm trying to, uh, so I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and that's, uh, I'm trying to start with me. Uh, I hope that was, that was good, but it's a tough question.
So I was wondering if by cognitive function you meant cognitive performance, but that the use of drugs doesn't actually change structurally what happens in someone's brain. And if that's the case, is a full neurological recovery possible? And what differentiates between the people who are able to ability, uh, like regain the ability to abuse substances and what, isn't, what stops them from being able to? Um, now, I didn't say that drugs don't affect people's cognitive performance. Now, uh, we take amphetamines, for example, to affect our cognitive performance. Um, our pilots in our military take amphetamines so they can function longer and be more focused, truck drivers, all of that sort of things. Amphetamines are outstanding in that regard. That's so, and also you take other drugs to um, lessen your sort of focus on things and to, um, so you can uh, do other things. So the goal of drug use is to alter your consciousness and impact your functioning. That's the goal. So I didn't say that. What I was saying was that the long-term consequences uh, of uh, drug use, um, particularly with methamphetamine users, um, have not, the evidence has not supported the notion that these people are cognitively impaired as a result. I also do come from a science background, so I love the distinction you made between images and real data. Um, thinking about educating professionals and who should be re-educated in order to have better drug literacy, how do we re-educate like doctors and nurses so that they can better inform patients or should they be talking about drugs and drug usage and like thinking about how, you know, we've legalized marijuana. If we legalize different drugs down the road, how do you have medical practitioners then integrate that into the conversation of, you know, other avenues that people might be using to, with just within their life? Thank you. Um, so the thing that we have to understand when we think about the medical profession, nurses, doctors, um, when people come to them, uh, people are coming to them with a problem. Those are the people who have a problem. That's the select group that actually has a problem. And so it's easy for doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals to be afflicted with this clinic clinician bias, thinking that all the people I see have a problem, so therefore drugs are a problem. And cops do the same thing in that the people that they deal with, they have a problem. And so everybody who does this activity has a problem. And that's wrong, right? That's illogical. And, and so um, I am hard pressed to um, enlist clinicians, particularly uh, those folks in our sort of educational, our re-educational campaign for the country. Uh, because in both cases, cops, healthcare professionals, um, they can be paternalistic. They know what's best for you, which is not true, of course, but that's how their training is in many cases. And so, that becomes problematic. In, in terms of the field of drugs, um, healthcare professionals are as worse as cops. Um, because at some level, if you get sent to the criminal justice system, you have a time limit on your sentence. In medicine, if you get afflicted with substance use disorder or addiction, you're an addict for life. There's no evidence for that, but that's what the field says. And so your sentence is a life sentence. Uh, and so um, I teach at a medical school and um, I have little hope for the, for the people in medicine to lead um, our re-education efforts. Uh, eventually, though they will follow. Uh, just think about all the nonsense we said about marijuana in the 90s even. I mean, I'm not even talking about the 30s, but the 90s 
uh, the early 2000s. Uh, in 92, when Bill Clinton ran for president, he couldn't even admit having smoked marijuana because of the nonsense. That's changed. Uh, but it, it wasn't led by medicine. It was led by ballot initiatives, the people. And so my faith is in the people and these other institutions will follow. Hi, sort of a similar one. You talked about how um, the academics in your field sort of perpetuate these mistruths about what we think we know about addiction. I was just curious about how your work is perceived in your academic field. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how my work is perceived? Wow. <laughs> Be before 2013, the publication of High Price, um, it was perceived really well. I was the first black scientist to be tenured at Columbia. Um, so that, no, 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 please, please, please. That's an embarrassment. That's really an embarrassment. That's an embarrassment for the United States. That, that's really, by the way, if you don't know, Columbia is in Harlem, one of the most important black communities in the country. And so that's a really embarrassing. So it was, it was received really well um, because I was, um, I was carrying the party line. Um, I got all the big grants um, and, uh, and then my conscience, I started to learn things and I started to get better at my craft and then I realized we were perpetrating a fraud on the American public. And so uh, my science is perceived as fine, uh, but um, my style, my delivery, uh, whatever, me being out here, um, people uh, criticize sometimes. Um, uh, but the science itself still get many publications, still doing that sort of thing. I still get invited to do grant reviews and all the rest of these kind of things. Um, but I don't know if I'll make it into the National Academy of Science uh, as a result. Not that I give it, not that I care, you know? So, uh, so thank you all. Last question. Okay. One last, there was a lady had her hand up. Yeah. Just a quick question to follow up on the question before last. The medical profession in the United States was very implicated in not paying very good attention to science and pushing, pay, believing pharmaceutical companies and pushing OxyContin. And now the medical profession, certainly in this state, has been awakened to the fact that they didn't do a very good scientific job. Does that not present an opportunity for education? Uh, now, I think the OxyContin story is, um, it's been overblown. So Purdue, uh, one of the things that they did was they were able to say that OxyContin was not as addictive as other opioids, and they got away with that in their marketing. Um, and that was just overblown. Um, so it really wasn't the medical profession uh, that is to be blamed so much there um, because you can imagine in, in 1999 there was a doctor in before this whole crisis a doctor in Oregon who got sued because he was under treating a pain patient um, and he uh, may have lost his license or almost lost his license uh, and so you can imagine uh, physicians they're afraid particularly now. Now, if they prescribe opioids, they're in trouble. Um, in the 90s, it was like you're not prescribing enough and treating pain. So they just, they're going back and forth. Like me, as a black man, for example, when I get pain prescriptions, um, I, over time, I realize I have a problem going to the pharmacy. Like my physician is black, so it's it's cool in that regard, but the pharmacy stops my prescription uh, that my physician wrote. And so everybody's afraid. The pharmacists is afraid. Uh, the insurance companies are the ones who are really benefiting because they don't have to pay for this anymore, even if your physician prescribe it, because the, the, the pharmacist will stop it. So I just do what 
well, I know a country I'm in. I'm married to a white woman, so I'd have her go fill the prescription, and it's fine. Um, but this is what happens in, in our country. We go, the pendulum shifts too far back and forth. Um, and so I worry about vilifying physicians because when people really need pain medications, they're not going to be able to get them. And opioids, they are, they've been around forever, and they've been around because they're so good at dealing with certain types of pain. And I'm afraid, I'm worried that they won't be available, and then we're going to send people out into the streets to seek to get their opioids. But physicians are just too afraid, and we understand why they are. And so I, I worry about blaming them um, for this. Uh, Purdue got away with saying that OxyContin was not as addictive as other opioids. Um, patients also have a responsibility too, and we haven't talked about that much. Um, like, I know when I'm taking opioids, one of the things that you know before you start to really have a problem, you get constipated. You know, and then you start to see constipation, and it's like, oh, something's wrong. Pay attention to your body. Are you going to continue to pop the pills? Come on. We know. We know, and we, we also share in that responsibility. Thank you all so much for coming out. <laughs>